All right. Good to see all you guys. So I'm in a different location today, but we'll do the same studying. So we're in lesson number 10. And we started that last time. We're doing Augsburg Confession 10. This will be the last time everything lines up neatly. Well, I guess 11. I'll start with 11. And then we're going to be moving forward. And I wrote the worksheets for 11 and 12. So I'm excited to get to those. But we got to work through here first. So we're talking about the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. We just started it last time. And I asked you to do some homework to tell me about which name for communion you liked best and why that is. So let's hear from each of you on that one. So who is going to go first here? Titus? Yes. I prefer the sacrament of the altar. I like this title because it lets no room for heresies like it is not really a true sacrament. It says in its name, the sacrament of the altar. Secondly, at an altar, sacrifices take place. By including altar in its name, it reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It is also important to remember that it is not a sacrifice, because a sacrifice is something we do for God. Communion is not that. Just All sacrifice. right, good. Excellent. Well done. Who's going to go next? All right, Hadley. I like the name um, Table of the Lord because it's the Lord's table in which we eat. Because the disciples on the Last Supper gathered around the table to eat with Jesus. Excellent. Very good. Excellent. Okay, who's up? Next, Jude. Eucharist is my favorite term for communion. This is so because it is a Greek word. It also reminds us that communion is a sacrament, not a sacrifice from us. For the only thing we can give God is thanks, and Eucharist means I give thanks. If you say Eucharist quickly, it sounds like you in Christ. It also is also an intelligent sounding word. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why you like it, Jude, right? Because it's Greek and it sounds intelligent. All right, those are good answers. Those are good reasons, though. That's great. Oliver? Um, I chose breaking of the bread. I like it because how it actually sounds like holy and you know god actually did it so that makes it sound like it's an appropriate name for it um and it sounds like it it will give those means of grace that are given through the sacrament of the lord's supper and um it also includes one of the worldly elements in baptism in it which is bread the bread oh, yeah lord's supper yeah outstanding you guys each chose a different one without even talking with each other that's really good and you all gave good reasons why you like those names. I think you're on right on the right track. Well done. Good job, guys. All right. Now we're going to start by looking at the Bible. So we've got to look at two verses here. The key verses. First one's going to be from Matthew 26. And this is where we have Jesus giving us the Lord's Supper. And if you look in your Bible, it might have a heading, something like Institution of the Lord's Supper or something like that. Titus? May I recite it from memory? Because we're supposed to learn it for First Communion. Oh, really? So you're learning it, huh? All right. Let's hear it, Titus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when whoa, he... whoa, 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 stop. Because you're actually doing 1 Corinthians. So I'll let you do it when we get to that. You're, learn you're giving us the words of institution. But Matthew is telling us the story about when Jesus did it on the first Lord's Supper oh. in the old group, Passover. But you're on the right track, Titus. All right. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to be at verse 26. Okay. Yeah. Let's get your Bibles. Yep. Matthew what? Just look. Like, Matthew 26, 26. All right. So yeah. we read there. Now, as this is during the Last Supper, when Jesus is on the last Passover, it's on Monday, Thursday. Remember, during Holy Week? And he's with his disciples. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said... Take eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right. So this is Jesus. It's on Monday, Thursday. He's in the upper room. And he takes the bread and he says, take eat. This is my body. Takes the cup and he says, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant shed, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So how does the Lord's Supper then fit our three criteria for a sacrament to be a sacrament? Remember what they are? So how do we have the three things happening here? Titus? 
The bread and wine is the element of the earth. Yes, the bread and wine is the element of the earth. Is it being commanded by Jesus? Yes, right there. Take, yes. Eat. Okay. Yes, indeed. He says, take, eat. Okay. And then do we have a promise of grace? Yes. Where's Shed that, Oliver? Um, it says, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Excellent. So it's for the forgiveness of sins. So the Lord's Supper does, definitely fits the three criteria commanded by Christ, element of the earth, and the promise of grace. They're all three here. So that's excellent. Good. All right. Then our next verse is from 1 Corinthians. And the 1 Corinthians is kind of interesting because this isn't from the Gospels, obviously. This is from a letter of St. Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he's teaching them because there were some problems in the church in Corinth, and they weren't quite doing things the way they should with the Lord's Supper. They were um, not treating it the way they should, and there were some divisions happening. And so Paul is correcting some of the mistakes they're making, and he's teaching them about what they should be doing with the Lord's Supper. So it's very interesting the way he writes this. So he writes in verse 23 of chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. So in other words, he's saying, I was taught this, I got this from God, from Jesus, and now I'm giving it to you. And he's even saying, I taught it to you when I was with you. So Jesus was already teaching them about the Lord's Supper while he was still with them in Corinth. And then now he's writing a letter to them a few years later, reminding them of what they learned. And here he goes on then. Then on the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And now here's the part that you are memorizing, Titus. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said... This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, now the different translations will have it different ways. And you heard pastors say it differently, but it's getting the same idea. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also we took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right. And so this is where Paul is giving us the words of institution that we're being taught. And again, we have the same things happening. This is my body, which is for you. And now we have the command, do this in remembrance of me. And that shows up in the other gospels besides Matthew. And then this cup is the new covenant to my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so what Paul is doing and what we do in our words of institution is we take all the different gospel accounts and kind of put them together from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then we give it to us in kind of a consolidated, this is what we call the words of institution. Sometimes people call these the ipsima verba, which is, means the very words, and it's Latin for the very words, the words that Jesus spoke. So why do we, in communion on a Sunday morning, why do we say those exact words just like that before we take communion? Titus, go ahead. I thought I did. To remind us exactly what is happening in this sacrament and that it is a sacrament. To, okay. kind, of, to kind of get us yes. fresh. That's good. Any other thoughts on why we use these exact words? Yeah, Hadley. Because they were the words that Jesus said when he took it and gave it to them. Yes, these are the words that Jesus chose to say. And so we don't want to change what Jesus gave us. So Jesus used those words. We will use those words. And that's why doesn't matter where you go to church or what church you're in. You're going to hear almost the exact same words every time, no matter how many times you tell it, several like communion or even what the other kind of liturgy is around it. When it comes time for the Lord's Supper, those are the words that were used. On the night the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. When you give him thanks, he broke it and gave this apple saying, take, eat. This is my body. And so we have that memorized. And we say it the exact same way because that's how Jesus gave it to us. Oliver? Um... Having read of the names of the Lord's Supper, and we were looking it up, and one of the names that it gave us was the liturgy. Oh, okay. The liturgy itself, yeah. Oh, why? Well, why because we the liturgy, liturgy means the work of the people, and it's the kind of the um, the things that we do all around it. I would say liturgy is usually a broader word that means our usual set way of worshiping and wouldn't be limited only to communion. It might mean even more things, but it's possible that somebody might use the word liturgy to refer to that. Okay. All right. So this is where Jesus gave us the sacrament. He established it, that it is his true body and his true blood given to us. And so 
This is then what is being taught in the Augsburg Confession. So we go to Augsburg Confession, Article 10, and we read there, concerning the Lord's Supper, they teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and are distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper. They disapprove of those who teach otherwise. So how do we, why do we believe that Jesus Christ is truly present? Because he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And as Luther taught very clearly, is means is. And so if Jesus says, this is my body, then it really is his body. And if he says, this is my blood, then it really is his blood. Oliver. So then if um, like another religion or something does not believe that the bread and wine is actually his body and his blood, um, the Bible says it is his body and is his blood. And no doubt about that, it is his body. Right. That's exactly right. And that's why we teach it. Now, does it make sense that Jesus could put his body and blood into a cup that looks like bread and wine? No. Not really. But why do we believe it then? Because he because said the it. The Bible says so. Because he said he so. Said because Jesus made the promise. We don't have to understand it. It doesn't have to make sense. We believe it because we trust the promise of Jesus. Go ahead, Titus. Um. Probably some of those um, thoughts that if it doesn't make sense in my brain, then it's probably not true, came from Thomas Aquinas. Cause well, he, he Thomas didn't Aquinas was, he didn't, he was a very careful thinker, and he thought about a lot of things, and he wanted things to make sense. But Aquinas also knew that there were things we can't understand about God, and he was willing to admit that. People, people came along and did not understand that, so they thought, oh... That means if it doesn't make sense, it's not true. That's not yeah, what, that not means, what that people came to believe. Well, there are a lot of people who still think that, and a lot of Christians who think what God does should make sense to me. And so what they're really doing is they're saying that God should do things the way that they think he should do them, the way that makes sense to them. But God never promises to do things the way we like or things that make sense to us. He prom He just does what he wants to do. And whether or not it makes sense is not the criteria of whether or not it's true, even though some people think maybe it is that way. Oliver? Um. So the thing that, that the saying, which is, some people say seeing is believing. Um, does that a little bit have to do with uh, um, what you were just talking about before? Yeah, exactly. Seeing is believing. Or in Missouri, some of you know that the state motto is the show me state, which means I've got to see it to believe it. Truth. Which is not a good thing. No, not necessarily a good thing. And that works fine for some things, but when it comes to theology or to God's truth, the show me idea is not good. And the idea of seeing is believing is not good. We believe, and then we are able to see. So believing is seeing is really how we would talk about it as Christians. All right. Now, what Luther teaches in his small catechism, then, is that Jesus is truly present. And he uses the phrase that Jesus is present in, with, and under the bread and wine. You remember learning that from the small catechism? That Jesus is present. That's for your blanks to fill in there on your worksheet. That Jesus is present in, with, and under the bread and wine. So what do you think? What does it mean to say that Jesus is present in, with, and under the bread and wine? What's that mean? Titus? It means he is in the bread and wine, through and through, no doubt about it. He's always there, everywhere. Correct. Yes, he is there through and through, always there. Is it? Does that mean that if you crack open the bread, you'll see Jesus' body? No. <laughs> no. no. Does it mean that if you look underneath the patent, that's the little plate that they have the bread on, that you'll see Jesus' body underneath it? No. Under it, find it? No. In, with, and under is just Luther's way of saying, I'm not really sure how it works, but he's there. And so okay. he's not he's not trying to explain it. And this is very important. So what is exactly does this mean? What this means is that Jesus is present because he promised it and we believe it. We don't have to explain it. When you try to explain how Jesus is present, you usually get into trouble. But we don't explain it. And we don't say, well, Jesus is present because or it works this way. We just say, no, he's promised to be there. And if Jesus is there, all of Jesus is there. And remember, Jesus is always true God and true man together. 
And so if Jesus is present, that means he's present with his body and his blood and his whole person. He's always present. Okay? So that's what we mean. And that means we believe in what we call the sacramental presence. Okay? The sacramental presence. And that means that Jesus is present with his body and his blood in a sacramental way. We don't understand it. The bread doesn't taste like body and the wine doesn't taste like blood. And it's not like the bread and wine somehow magically changes into um, uh, the, the body that we're kind of chewing on like a finger or something. Kind of, that'd be kind of gross. But what we believe is that Jesus is present with his true body and blood in a sacramental way that we can't understand. And we trust that promise of Jesus that that's what's going on. And again, this is the last blank there. We believe this because of Jesus' promise. Because Jesus has said it, we believe it. Titus, you got a question? Yes. Are we the only church body that believes that it is the true body and blood and the bread and wine? No, not at all. In fact, we would say <laughs> that um, we're not the only ones at all. Roman Catholics also believe that it is the true body and blood of Jesus. And Anglicans or Episcopalians, <laughs> excuse me, also believe it is the true body and blood of Jesus. And there are a few others as well. But Lutherans and Roman Catholics and Episcopals or Anglicans are pretty much the, the main ones. Most of your Protestant churches or your Reformed churches don't do that. They don't, they don't function that way. They believe that it's just a symbol or it's just a reminder, but it's not really the body and blood of Jesus. It just reminds us of that. Okay? So that's where I want to get into in the next part of the discussion here. There are basically two other ideas that Christians have about this sacrament, okay? So let's talk about those. All right, there. So that's how you spell sacramental. I got that up there for you, okay? Okay. But now, the two other ways that people think about the sacrament, basically, we're going to talk about how these work. The first ones we're going to talk about are Roman Catholics. So Roman Catholics, they also believe that Jesus Christ is truly present. So they believe in the true presence of Christ. They believe that it is his body and blood that they're really there. And that's good because that's what Jesus said. This is my body. This is my blood. So they believe it's really his body and blood. So that's what they teach. They teach that it is the body and blood of Jesus. Okay. So you can fill that in on your blanks there underneath, right behind it says Roman Catholic. They teach. So they teach that that is the body and blood of Jesus. Okay. Titus. Is the problem that they think once the Pope consecrates it, it's supposed to be now the body and blood? Yeah. Well, no, we'll talk about the problem here in a minute. Let's, I want to talk a little bit more about what they believe about how Christ is present with his body and blood. <clears throat> Roman Catholics also teach them. They are interested in trying to give us maybe an explanation of how this works. And so they confess the right thing by saying it's the body and blood of Jesus. But then they also say... In an effort to explain it, they believe in something that we call transubstantiation, which is a very big loaded word. Transubstantiation. All right. Now, I want to teach you this word because it shows up sometimes and people might use it and you should know about this. So Roman Catholics would say that Jesus is present. It's really his body and blood because of transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. And what transubstantiation means is that it's following a very kind of um, hard to understand er idea from the Greek philosopher named Aristotle. Uh -huh. And you will learn more about this when you get a little bit older, but I'm going to tell you about it now. So you just get some kind of idea about it. Okay. So you understand a little bit. Aristotle taught that in everything that we see, whether it's a tree or or not just Aristotle, it would be Plato too. A tree, it's more like Plato actually, a tree or a rock or a rocket or a car or a person or a cat or a dog, anything we see. Patty, you got a question? Is it an ideal? It's getting kind of there. Let's talk about it a little bit. That everything we see has two things. One is what we see and he called those things the accidents. And those are things like the color of a thing, the size of a thing, the texture of a thing, um, the taste of a thing. Those are all accidents. And then he'd say, 
then also everything we see has a substance. The substance. And the substance is the real thing itself. So I'll try to give you an example that makes sense. If you see a pine tree and you see an oak tree, okay? You know what an oak tree looks like, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So an oak tree is a deciduous tree with a nice big trunk and a crown. And a pine tree, of course, is a tree that's a conifer and it looks very different, right? Mm -hmm. So we got two trees here, a pine tree and an oak tree. So what are the accidents of a pine tree? It's got needles. It doesn't lose the needles. They stay green all the time. It's sticky with sap and it's shaped like a triangle more or less with a kind of a pointy top. Titus? An accident is something you can change without completely changing the name of the thing that you're talking about. That's the idea. So the oak tree has accidents of branches that stick way out a more rounded shape. It loses its leaves. It has leaves that are big and flat and not needles. And so the accident of a pine tree and an oak tree are very different. Are they both trees? Yes. So they both share tree substance. They both have treeness about them, even though their accidents are different. Okay? Okay. So what about people? I have seen four different people I'm looking at. You all are people you all share people substance but are your accidents the same no no some of you have darker hair somebody's wearing glasses we got a girl we got boys we've got blonde hair we've got different eye colors i guess you're all blue eyed and different things different ages so the accidents are all different but the substance of person or human stays the same so what transubstantiation is saying is that when the priest says the Lord, the Lord's in the words of institution, this is my body, that they believe that at that moment that the substance of the bread, okay, so the bread in that is being used, which another word for that is the host, that the host is now no longer just bread, that the accidents of bread, that it's white and flat and kind of tasteless, they stay, but the substance changes. And now what happens is it becomes the body of Christ as the substance. And that's what happens. So the substance is the body of Christ, but the accidents are still the accidents of bread. And that's their effort to try to explain what's happening. That might be true, or it might not be true. The Bible never says this, so we don't make a big deal and we say, well, that's how it has to be. The Roman Catholics say, this explains it. We say, well, maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. So that's one of the things that's going on here. And that's what transubstantiation means. It means trans means changing the substance. So transubstantiation makes sense. We have the substance and we're changing the substance. That's what they think is happening during the Lord's Supper. Okay, Oliver? Um, so why do they call the bread the host? Well, we call it that too, because the host then carries the body of Christ to us. And so it's like a host delivering something, giving something to us, okay? okay. So it's called the host or the wafer or the bread, but host is a pretty common term. Now, that's still not the problem with Roman Catholic teaching. Because transubstantiation may or may not be true. We think it's not a wise idea to try to explain things that we don't need to explain. But the bigger problem with the Roman Catholic teaching is that they have this idea that they call the sacrifice of the mass. Oh. And, and so mass is the name for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. They believe that when the priest is saying the words of institution and celebrating the Lord's Supper, that he is actually re-sacrificing Jesus on the altar. They call it an unbloody sacrifice, and that he, by his actions of saying the words of institution and then distributing the bread and wine, that he is actually winning fresh forgiveness for everybody who is present. And that's the big problem with the Roman Catholic teaching, because that ends up teaching that the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the giving of the bread and wine is maybe not enough that when the priest says it, he's getting brand new, fresh forgiveness. And that's a big problem. And so the idea of the sacrifice that when we go to communion or when the priest does communion, that he is earning new forgiveness. 
that's a big problem. Anytime anybody talks about earning forgiveness or earning grace, that's a big problem. Titus? Um, in Luther's day, they would just parade around with it and make big parades, and no one would actually eat it. And they would just that's think a- that they're just earning new forgiveness and merit with doing that. By looking at it. Well, that's called a Corpus Christi processional, which means Corpus Christi literally means body of Christ. The town in Texas is named Corpus Christi, Texas. And so that means body of Christ. And so the body of Christ is a, a processional where you take the words, the body, the bread, and you parade it around. And that's kind of misusing the sacrament as well. But the biggest problem is this idea that we are earning new forgiveness. And if the idea that we're going to win fresh forgiveness, we're giving a sacrifice that wins forgiveness from God, that's a problem. And so that's the biggest problem with Roman Catholic teaching. Okay. Now, Reformed people or evangelical people, and that means most Protestants like Baptist or Methodist or um, Presbyterians, they also have different kinds of teaching about the Lord's Supper. They would say, and they vary in this, but broadly, most of them would say, especially a Baptist would say, that the Lord's Supper is a special meal, and it's a symbol for believers of the presence of Jesus. And so they would say that when Jesus said, this is my body, he didn't really mean is. He meant represents or symbolizes. And so that the bread makes me remember and think about Jesus. And then the wine makes me think about the blood of Jesus. And then it's a nice symbol. And for them, the Lord's Supper then becomes a reminder of what Jesus did for them. And it makes them feel good to remember that Jesus loves them so much but they don't really believe it's the body and blood of Jesus, okay? So they teach it as a symbol for believers. Titus? We have a Bible that um, that the little guys, that the daddy said to Isaiah to little guys, and it's actually um, evangelical, and they say, um, this is like my body and this is like my blood, and daddy has to switch it every time they get to the story. Yeah, there are a lot, there are a lot of... Bible story books that we have for kids, like children's Bible story books that are published by Protestants or by evangelicals. And they're basically very good Bible story books. But sometimes when they come to things like sacraments, like baptism or the Lord's Supper, they don't always do a very good job. And they'll say things like this, this bread represents my body or reminds me of my of Christ's body. And so that's why, yeah, your parents will just change the words. I do that sometimes too. When I'm reading something and the teaching, the theology is not right, then you just need to change it to make it so it is right. All right. Now, the big problem, though. So what's the problem? It's not just a symbol. It is really the body and blood of Jesus. But the bigger problem with the Reformed teaching is not just that they believe it's not really the body and blood of Jesus. That's bad enough because they're not recognizing Christ is there because he promised to be there. But the even bigger problem is that they believe that Jesus is only present if you believe. And so they make it something that I have to do, that my faith makes it work. And that's the big problem with the Reformed and Evangelical teaching, that our faith makes it work. And so the problem there is then that if I go to communion and I think, did I get forgiveness of sins? Well, if I believe enough, then I did. Well, what happens if I'm not sure if I really have a strong faith that day or I have some, you know, can God really forgive me? And if it depends on you having the right attitude or the right faith to make it work, then it's not very comforting. The great comfort for us is that everybody who goes to the rail gets the body and blood of Jesus no matter what. That's the, what we stress and teach, okay? And so the important thing is that Everybody who takes communion is getting the body and blood of Jesus, whether they believe it or not. Your believing it doesn't make it happen. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. Questions, Oliver. Um, so when they're coming home from church and they just and they're thinking about, did I have enough faith? Um, wouldn't that be most of the time that you're thinking, was I good enough? Did I have enough faith to be able to do this? Because you didn't have the teaching that we did. That's exactly why it's a problem, Oliver, because we have human, we're human beings and we often have doubts and we start to wonder, well, I wonder if I did it right. Was I, was I thinking hard enough about Jesus? Was I being, was I being reverent enough? 
Oh, I don't know. And then you wonder, why? I wonder if I really got Jesus' body and blood. I wonder if I got forgiveness. I don't think I did. And now all the comfort is gone and all the assurance of Jesus loving you is gone. And that's why it's important to stress that the body and blood of Jesus comes and is given to us, not because of what we do, but because of Christ's promise. And everybody there gets it. This is one of the reasons why we practice something called closed communion. And we don't say, anybody who wants to come to communion, come on up here. No, we say, if you believe what we believe, and you know that this is the body and blood of Jesus, come on up. Because what happens if somebody who doesn't think it's really the body and blood of Jesus and doesn't care, they go up and take communion. Do they get the body and blood of Jesus? Yes, yes. and you get they, stay yes, near they it. do. But they're not getting it to their help. It's going to actually hurt them because they're acting like it doesn't matter. It's like they're saying, who cares? And it's just Jesus' body and blood, and that kind of doesn't matter. And so it's a very big deal because everybody who takes communion gets the body and blood of Jesus. We want to make sure that the people who are getting communion are those who belong there and are know that they're receiving the body and blood of Jesus and are able to receive it to their benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay, Titus? Yeah. It's dangerous for people who go up there and eat the bread and have no idea what they're actually doing. That's correct. The Bible, and Paul actually says that some of you have not been recognizing the body of Christ in the sacrament, and that's why some of you are sick and some of you have even died because you're not recognizing what Jesus is doing, that he's really present. Yeah. Paul says wow. that in 1 Corinthians. Yeah. And so that's why it's important that we teach you so that <laughs> before you take communion, you are thinking, oh, I'm receiving the body and blood of Jesus. This is a very special gift. And you're not acting like, ah, who cares? It's no big deal. It's a big deal. Hadley? So do they like, because they ate that sacrament, do they like die? Well, St. Paul said that that was happening to some people in the church in Corinth. And can that still happen today? It's possible. And I don't know that it's happened. I have, can't think of a time I could say, oh, this happened one time. A guy came to the communion and he dropped dead at the altar. But it, it's possible. But it, what we do know is that it's not a good thing for us to be receiving the sacrament, not recognizing that it's really the body and blood of Jesus. Okay? Got it. All right. So we got a few more things to fill in to finish up this worksheet. Two more things. It is important to recognize two aspects of the sacrament. One, because God is doing the work, it is always efficacious. Remember that word? Okay, so I'm going to remind you of that word. I'll put it up here. I'll, I'll put that one in the chat box for you. Okay, give me just a second here. <clears throat> All right, there's efficacious. What does efficacious mean? Uh, efficacious means it means efficient yeah you're on the right track it means it affects things it makes things work yeah. it always works so efficacious affects things it makes things happen so because god is doing the work it is always efficacious it is always making things happen it always does what it's supposed to do so Every single time that the pastor says the words of institution and distributes the bread and wine, is it the body and blood of Jesus? Yes. yes. Every single time. And every single time that somebody says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and applies water, is that person being claimed by God and given the gift of faith? Yes. And giving the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of God's forgiveness? Yes. Every time. Okay, because God has promised it. That's how it works. God is doing the work. It is always efficacious. And when faith is present, this is part two. When faith is present, then the sacrament is not only efficacious, but it is also beneficial. And so it is benefits me. It is good for me. It gives me a good gift. That's the difference where I guess you have a unbeliever who goes up to communion and receives the body and blood of Jesus, but doesn't think it's any big deal, doesn't believe, doesn't care. It's not beneficial to them because they don't have faith to receive the benefit. So faith doesn't make the sacrament happen, but faith does make the sacrament beneficial and worthwhile. Does that make sense? Yes. So faith is important, but faith doesn't create the sacrament. Okay, Hadley. That's why when we were visiting a new church somewhere, I think it was in Florida or somewhere, um, because we were going on vacation, that's why Daddy had to tell the pastor that we were okay to eat communion. 
Yeah. That's exactly right. Because you were doing a courtesy and that was right for your dad to do that, to talk to the pastor and let them, the pastor know who you were so that he would know it's okay to commune you because you're part of what we confess and believe here. We're part of the same church together. That's right. Good. So the sacrament works because God promises and faith receives it. So it's beneficial. So the last question here, why don't young children receive the Lord's Supper? Titus? They might not know what's going on. Okay. Do they does making do they does knowing what's going on make the sacrament happen for them? No, but it, but they don't get the benefit. Exactly. Good, Oliver. What were you going to add in there? Nothing. Okay. We'll do the same things that Titus said. Okay. Good. Yeah. So go ahead, Hadley. So and that like we talked about, it could be dangerous because they don't know what they're doing. Oh, yum! Just a snack. Go go go! Yum yum yum. That's what? right. And so we don't just give it out. In a, in a careless way the other thing to remember is that saint paul says in first corinthians when he's teaching these church these christians in corinth how to celebrate the lord's supper the right way he teaches that a man should examine himself before he takes communion and make sure that he is he's repentant and ready to receive the sacrament with faith and to his benefit and so the problem with a two-year-old or a baby is they're not old enough to examine themselves they probably and can't so even we, talk as well that's exactly right. And so that's why we wait till a child is a little bit older and they're able to examine themselves and think about the sacrament and receive the sacrament with repentance and with trust. And then we say this is a good thing. And so that's why First Communion has to have some instruction before it. But it doesn't have to mean you know all the teaching of the church or all the doctrine. You know enough to be able to receive the sacrament with faith and to your benefit. All right, good. Any other questions about Communion? No. All right, Titus. Well, um, one thing when you when when you know um er, almost everything um about your church's doctrine and stuff, and you're received as a member, that's confirmation. Yeah, confirmation is when you're usually a little bit older and you say, "I believe everything this church teaches," and you've learned everything from the small catechism, and then you get confirmed. That's right. That's confirmation. But it's a good idea. A lot of churches do this now. They separate First Communion from Confirmation, and I think that's a good idea. That's a good practice. All right, good. So that yep. finishes up Article 10 of the Augsburg Confession. That means we have 11 more I want to cover because I want to get through Augsburg Confession 21, which gives us through the, all the basic teachings of the Christian Confession. So next time we get together, we're going to do 11 and 12 and talk about confession and absolution or repentance, Okay. So we'll do that next time we get together. All right. Good. We'll see you guys later. Papa loves you. Bye.